You know, it's like, oh, oh, how come? Like, and I know the industry's like, oh shit, this is a great way to see black women all in one place. But why, why didn't we fucking think of this? You know, because y'all weren't thinking of us. So I provide, I'm providing an opportunity for black women to be seen by industry and for us to have support, for us to have an opportunity to network and bond and just continue to build an infrastructure. Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest is a five-day comedy festival that was born out of rage. After decades of being left out, unseen, and overlooked in the industry, comedian Joanna Briley decided it was time for Black comedians to have something of their own. Now in its fourth year, the Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest has partnered with The Chris David Show to bring you exclusive interviews with the headliners of the festival. Welcome back to The Chris David Show. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm your host, Chris David. Some of you may remember our next guest from her appearances on Def Comedy Jam, Showtime at the Apollo, and Comic View, or from her roles in Orange is the New Black, Bull, Power, and more recently as lovely flight attendant Bethany Collins in the Netflix sci-fi drama Manifest. Speaking of fest, this Brooklyn native is headlining the fourth annual Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest, June 14th to 18th in New York City. Let's all give a warm Chris David show welcome to actress and comedian extraordinaire, Mugger. Welcome, Mugger. That was a really nice intro. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. I didn't have to go far. (laughs) Oh, exactly. I I love this Mm because I literally just walked downstairs. (laughs) This is I, I can't stand it. I'm so tired of talking to little screens with people oh, in cyberspace. I'm used to yeah. real people and stuff and touching and moving I parts in person. I am too. But you know what? This is uh, this is a good start, though. For me, mm-hmm. this is a good start. So do you now now I gotta ask you, do you like going by Mugger or Mugger Phoenix? It's just Mugger. Just Mugger. I yeah. like that. How'd you get that name though? I had a feeling that was gonna be a question. It, it's from my dad. I'll leave it at that. Allegedly, it, it 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 was from my dad. It made me stop crying as a kid whenever he would say it. So, yeah. I like yeah. that. And Thank you. by the way, guys, Mugger, now, Mugger is just Mugger, but you know, I did say Mugger Phoenix, and Mugger is no relation to our friend to the show, Deshaun Phoenix, who's also from Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Um, Mugger, I'm going to have to put you on to Deshaun. He, he's something else. I'm, okay. I'll, I'll put you on to that later. He, he's, he's something else. But now I won't go into too much, but I'll just say this, you know, the early bird gets the worm. And thank you for being a class act. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for responding, you know, as early as you did. Thank you. I appreciate the interest. Definitely. I was like, why does he want to interview little old me? <laughs> well, well, listen, I'm going to tell you something. Speaking of phoenixes and birds, mm-hmm. I'm going to just say this. Let me get a basket. <laughs> I, I'll I, burn one and, and weave you one. I'll set you one up. That's right. But, but wait, not that basket. Because I remember you as Uh-oh. lady behind the counter. At, oh, you uh, mean a basket of impression. fried chicken. Oh, please. Oh, please. You know something? I really, really appreciate Lee Daniels giving me the opportunity. Mm-hmm. But I promise you, I have so much guilt about the way I treated her in that in that moment. Oh. And I've seen her, her Gabourey Sidibe, I've seen her over the years and I've apologized two or three times. She's like, it, it was work. We were acting, but right. I feel so bad. Oh. Like, yeah, you cursed the girl out for stealing the chicken. No, the character cursed the girl right. out. I didn't right. do it. <laughs> the character cursed the character out. Yes. Right, right, right. Yes. But I love that scene though. Like that. How did you, how did you even get that part? You know what's interesting? I auditioned for the part of uh, Cornrows, which Sherry Shepard got. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, and I was I was literally told, we really like you, but she's Sherry Shepard. So <laughs> she was a bigger name and I, I got okay. it. You know what okay. I'm saying? But I was grateful to still be welcomed onto the project. It was, mm-hmm. it was really a big deal for me. And you know, in, in, it was such a memorable role. You know, and, and and 
you know, obviously that was you acting, but I want to know how you got started in comedy. Oh, I actually got started in comedy kind of on a dare. Yeah. A friend of mine, you may know him, very hilarious, famous comedian, Will Sylvance. He's from Jersey. He's from Brooklyn, but he's in Jersey City. We met a long time ago. I used to work in the village at a, uh, the body shop, you know, the ones with the oils and all that stuff. And he was a customer. He'd come in and he uh, he told me he did comedy and we started talking and apparently I was funny to him. And he was like, you should come to the Uptown Comedy Club on Sunday nights. You should give it a shot. And, you know, we have lots of women in the audience and it's Harlem and they'll love you. I was like, oh, I don't know about that. And um, I kind of got tricked into doing it on a Super Bowl Sunday 20 some odd years ago. And I've been doing it ever since. That's amazing. I mean, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes that's what you got to do. You just got to go out and take a leap on, uh, take, take a leap of faith. Mm hmm. And just step out and just, you know, and just do it. But now, here's the thing. Were you funny before you did comedy? And when did you know you were funny? You know what? It's 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 interesting. It depends on who you ask. I grew up okay. with a very funny family. Mm -hmm. And I have an aunt in particular. Shout out Aunt Janelle. She's my dad's youngest sister. So she was more like a big sister to me than an aunt. And we just used to joke around and say anything to each other. And she used to always tell good jokes. And then I felt comfortable speaking back to my aunt as a sister, not a, not a niece. And it was freeing. So we joked about all kinds of things very freely. And I never thought I would have a comedy, uh, excuse me, have a career in comedy. People who knew me knew that I was funny because mostly I was quiet. But if I knew you, you'd get an earful. <laughs> yeah. And and now now I know you're from Brooklyn. What part of Brooklyn are you from? Okay. I have to make sure I get this correct because I, I represent the whole the whole thing. I was born in Bed Stuy. Nice. I, I lived in Bed Stuy the first nine years of my life, and then we moved to Bushwick. So I was in Bushwick for a chunk of my life. Then there was Crown Heights and East New York mixed in as well. But yeah, I'm I'm a Brooklyn girl. Listen. Shout out to Crown Heights, shout out to Brook Bushwick, shout out to Bed-Stuy, mm -hmm. New York, shout out to everybody, shout out mm -hmm. to the whole Brooklyn. Yeah. I tell you, this show, I have so many people from Brooklyn on, it's not even funny. Like, I am like an honorary Brooklynite. <laughs> what did your family say about you doing comedy when you told them you were doing comedy? They didn't really take me seriously. It, some people were like, okay, that's what she's doing because a lot of people didn't know that I was an actress first. So I became more popular as a comedian first. They're like, oh, you're a comedian and you're, you're acting now. No, I was always an actress first. I always, you know, performed. I danced when I was younger or what have you. But most of my family were like, you, you hardly talk to people, except for the aunt who knew. She knew, you know, we made jokes. We had our fun. But everybody was like, you? People I went to school with, like, you need to talk in school, you? It's an outlet, one that I was happy to find. And I didn't realize that until I found my voice as a comedian several years in, you know, into doing stand up. I'm like, OK, I see what this is and what what it's become for me. And it's empowering, you know. What was it like for you in the beginning, though, with the stand up? Like, you know, when you first got out there on stage? Well, it was terrifying. <laughs> first of all, it was very scary. Um, but once I understood that people came to hear what I had to say, I just made sure I, I brought the funny jokes. You know, you have to do the work. If you command that type of attention, you have to fill up that space with what people came for. And they came for jokes and laughter. So at that, it just took off from there. You know, I've always written. I'm a writer as well. So I've always written and I, I write my own material and, that's one of the things that keeps you going in this business. You always have to write. Even when you're not performing, you must write. So, yeah. That's very important. I hope y'all heard what Mugga just said. Mm -hmm. Very important to write. Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest, New York City, June 14th to 18th. Visit BWICLaughFest.com for tickets. Speaking of fest, 
I don't know if you, well, you did hear it during the intro, but I referred to you as the lovely flight attendant from, you know, Manifest. Because yeah. that was lovely what you did to help that passenger get out of that homophobic co uh, Caribbean country. I'm not going to mm -hmm. say which one. Yeah. I'm going to say which country. Okay. But I, and I know it was just a role because we talked about, you know, characters and roles and everything, but that character was indeed, you know, an ally. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you why it's so important as an actor to pick the right roles? Well, I think your roles are an extension of who, who you are as an artist and they're gonna be with you forever once they're done with your film or television. I think you should always choose things that you believe in as an artist, but also being a woman and a black woman I'm very conscious of choosing roles where I think that I can empower our people through the role, you know, and I didn't realize in, in helping Thomas, his name was Thomas, the character, to help Thomas escape the situation in a television show. I have people come up to me and actually applaud that I helped him get out of the situation. I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I did, but it was television. But I'm like, wait a minute, this is heavy. This is heavy and it, and it's really real to people. And that made me feel good because I'm like, okay, the work, the work speaks through the television and it helps people, you know, it helps people change their own lives or feel maybe empowered in moments when they didn't feel they could be, whether they're, you know, black, white, gay, woman, whatever. It, I, I appreciate having done that. And I look forward to getting more roles in that vein, in the same vein, you know. Exactly. And, and yeah, that was a wonderful work. One thing we need out here in the world is just more allies, just in yeah. general. Mm -hmm. um, now, the thing is, I try not to go too deep on here on the show, especially because we don't have a lot of time. And logistically, I'm not up for all that editing. <laughs> like, okay. I just can't do it. But I manifested this interview. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you what happened. When mm -hmm. I saw you were headlining, mm -hmm. I remembered you from Precious and from all those comedy shows that I had no business watching back in the day when I was a kid. Okay. I was watching them with my grandmother. God rest her soul. She was a Scorpio also, just like you. And so it was okay. Yeah. You know, but, but when I saw you, something spoke to my spirit and I said, she's going to come on my show and we're going to have a great moment. Oh and my goodness. This is You're like, me blush. we can't even blush. Listen. You can't see the blush through these brown cheeks. It don't take much with me. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate but, that. Yeah, but, 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 but definitely. And, and I wanted to ask you, do you believe in manifestation? Like what have you manifested? Absolutely. I, well, I believe that we both manifested this interview because your end couldn't come true without my, my side agreeing to it. The universe brought both together to make it real. So I've manifested things throughout my day, just the day starting today, yesterday. It's not easy to do because we get distracted by so many outside noises and voices, but I've, I've manifested things in my career, my personal life, in my spiritual life with my family. Yeah. You have, if you don't believe it, it's not going to be real. Like I said, a lot of times we, we hear a lot of noise and we're not able to hear the messages. If you're listening to noise, you miss the message. I listen intentionally for the messages when manifesting, and and it's real. It's and real. we have to listen to ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. that's the listen to the voice within because it's mm -hmm. never going to steer you wrong. I got into a debate with somebody though mm -hmm. a little while ago. Uh oh. And no, it's, it's not that. Well, I, I don't know. It could go either way, but I, I really want to get your take on it. And. It was that not all comics do stand-up and not all stand-ups are comics. Mm -hmm. And the argument was that someone could consider somebody like, you know, I don't know, like Will Smith, a comedian, even though he hasn't been known to do stand-up. Mm -hmm. Just like at some time, you know, I remember Wendy Williams was doing stand-up and she did a tour and she's not known to be a comedian. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I think there are funny people who happen to also be comedians. And I think there are people who aren't comedians that have uh, the power to create these uh, spaces for themselves in our world. I think Will is funny as a comedic actor. Of course, he doesn't do stand-up, 
But the same thing with Wendy Williams, my personal opinion, and I've worked with her. She had the power to put on a show and say she was a comedian for however many weeks the show went on, which was fine. But you mentioned earlier that you watched me on Def Jam and, and, and Comic View. And I've been doing this a long time. I paid a lot of dues, so I didn't skip to the front. People I come up with, we didn't get to skip to the front. We had to fight and scrape and scrap through the early 90s when there was no Black comedy scene. We created one. We created one. You know what I'm saying? And there was a lot of hustling. There were a lot of ups and downs. There were a lot of nights of not getting paid. There were a lot of nights of you had to remain professional no matter what. As a comedian, there are nights when the mic doesn't work. There are times when you have to rely on things you didn't know you had to get through a show. Cut to living through what we're living through now, where all you need is a phone to, to be a comedian, an actor. You can be whatever you want. I am not judging. I'm just saying certain people have had experiences that I can show you the stripes on my back. A lot of people showed up and got attention in those stripes. I can't say that I, that I respect them highly. They have a right to live, but yeah, it, there's something to be said for over 25 years of scraping and scrapping. And I'm still, I'm still doing the same thing, scraping and scrapping. I'm in a better place than I used to be, but a lot of people are a lot further along for different reasons. And it, and it is honestly frustrating sometimes, but you know, I, I go with what I have. I'm true to the craft. That, that's the one thing I'll die with. I'm true to the craft, both of my crafts, acting and stand up. And you know, <clears throat> the other thing in comedy, and I say like in show business, period, you have to be versatile. And, I, and you know, like I mentioned my grandmother earlier, she loved Wayne Brady and Bernie Mac. And mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. Wayne Brady is pretty much a 90s r and singer, but with better like comedic time. I love Wayne <laughs> Brady. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like, you just have to be all encompassing. You have to be a double, triple, quadruple threat. Mm -hmm. You have to know how to do so much. Yeah. And I think that today, I'm going to just say it because you ain't going to say it because you nice. I'm going to just say it. <laughs> I'm going to just say it. These kids don't have it. i be honest. Some of them just don't have it. And the ones that do have it, they get overshadowed and outshined by the ones who don't. And it's upsetting. It's upsetting to watch because I can look at a person and I can look at talent and I can tell talent. Yeah. And to see them not get the recognition and the stripes mm -hmm. that you were talking about is very upsetting. It, but, it is. Yeah. But it can be frustrating oh, because, because yes. um, excuse me. No, go ahead. I think that there's, there's space in, in, for everyone to express themselves. But to profess to know something that you just showed up on the scene for, that's frustrating to me. And, I, and I'm and i like, whether it's a young new artist, there are young new artists that are hilarious. They're comedians and singers that are great. Like you said, they get overshadowed because maybe they don't have enough followers. They don't have enough likes. That has very little to do with uh, talent a lot of times. But we live in a space where you can get away with it. A lot of people are getting away with a lot of things that they probably shouldn't even be getting away with. My concern and my responsibility to myself is to stay focused, keep working, stay on stage, keep writing to stay. I have to stay in it to continue to call myself an artist, no matter what I feel about what other people over here are doing over here are doing, you know. What is your writing process like? I don't really have a process because there's so much stuff going on in my brain that things just fall out sometimes onto the page. I can I can have different ideas about three or four different stories at one time. So I have to focus, but there's no real process. I could be driving and things pop in my head. The name of a character per se. I've done that. I've I've had names pop in before the story or certain actors that I would see playing a role in something that I wrote. I'll create around the actor, you know, I, I, okay, how do I use this as an example? Well, we were talking about Will Smith. I could see Will and say, okay, that's the, that's the man in the story. And I'll start writing the story around the actor that I see playing, playing the role. Yeah. And you create like just a whole template for him, like, you know, what he likes to eat, 
where he yes. likes to what he likes to do on his weekends. Yeah. Um, you know what what he has in his house, things like that. Um, smells. I do him. smells also. What things would smell like? What he would smell like? What a person's house might smell like? And you can't mm -hmm. smell through a story, but it's part of my process. Does this person wear cologne or not? Mm -hmm. You know, what? how tall, how short, but how does a person walk? I think I look at things like that. How does he walk? What is it? I, you know, you, it, 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 it sounds weird, but this is how my, not real process, but these are how things, these are, this is how things come to me. I'm like, okay, hmm. I and see a story actually, here. To <laughs> me, it doesn't sound weird because I, you know, I've read, you know, Uta Hagen and, I mm -hmm. studied acting at one point, mm -hmm. at one okay. point in life. Okay, okay. And what, do, a little, do a little things, you know, do a little something. But what I've found is that all of these things add into who that character is going to become. And they help the actor just, you know, create these characters that we fall in love with. I, I was told by, by one of my acting professors, we don't act in this class become these people, you become these people. And becoming the person, look at everything. I'm, I'm talking about smells. What does it smell like in here? What do I smell like? What kind of deodorant do I wear? Um, um, what do I eat? Who are my friends? Do I have friends? You know, you start asking and answering these questions in your head with regard to who the character is to, is to become once you breathe the life into them. The writer writes the story, but you breathe the life into the character. Currently, we're going through the writer's strike. Um, yep. What, if any, advice? Solidarity. <laughs> I'm not I hear that. but I support my writers because if they don't, if they're not writing, we're not working. So I, I haven't exactly. written anything that put myself on television. Other people have, so we we stand in solidarity, right. definitely. And it's only so, right. Yeah, I, I agree. But would you offer like any advice or encouragement um, for your colleagues and everyone being affected, other than that? I, I don't know about advice, but I would offer up the fact that they need to know that they are not alone. There are so many people with them. I mean, there's times when people are on the picket line and you're just, you know, your guild is on the picket line. So many people from the DGA, from SAG, there's a lot, a lot of support because they're supporting a, a realistic cause. And it's time for it's time for people to step up and pay what they're supposed to be paid. Everyone wants to be paid equitably. You know, and, and it's not happening. A few years ago, when I was on Orange is the New Black, they were paying, the residuals that we were being paid were so low, there was a threat of a strike, but we didn't have to strike. They went to the bargaining table and our residuals went up almost 300% because they were making the money. Pay the artists, pay the people who create the shows, you know, be fair. It's about being fair. Y'all heard what Mother said. Be Do the fair. Right thing. Do mm -hmm. the right thing. Yep. Um, do you have a pre-show ritual though? Like before you go on stage? Not really. I still get nervous every night, but not and I have a ritual, you know, trying not to not to get in my head too much. Say a little prayer to myself, you know, but yeah. That that's, that's it. There's no real ritual. <laughs> like, oh Lord, please help me <laughs> help me get through this one. <laughs> but that's a that's a good one. That definitely that's a good one. Um, speaking of shows, um, tell us about the Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest that you're headlining. Oh yes, jo Joanna Briley's baby. She came up with this concept some years ago, and it's just been an amazing vehicle for Black women in comedy. The festival is a uh, every year. I've not headlined before, but I've been, did I headline last week? Wait a minute, wait a minute. I think I headlined, ooh, ooh. I'm not sure if it was headlining last year or not. But yes, Joanna Briley came up with the, the idea for the festival. And it's been an awesome thing to see grow from just something we started in the city, in the boroughs. And now we're doing stuff in Philly and DC and it's growing and women across the country are finding out about it and people are becoming a part of it and volunteering. And it's such an amazing thing for women who generally felt voiceless historically, especially in this country, to finally have another vehicle to express and, and you know, have our voices be heard. I think it's a great thing. Absolutely wonderful. It's exciting. I'm excited about it. 
I've been on the show before, but every year it just it grows and grows so much more. And I'm more proud and proud each year of all the women involved, all of us. Definitely. Um, the festival runs uh, from Wednesday, June 14th through Sunday, mm -hmm. June 18th. Yes. Um, everyone can visit BWICLaughFest.com for more information on tickets, lineups, and locations. You can also follow BWIC Laugh Fest on IG, and that's B as in Black, W as in Woman, I as in In, C as in Comedy, Laugh, L-A-F-F, Fest, all one word. Make sure you have three Fs. If you have two, you'll be on the wrong page. So get those tickets ASAP before the price goes up, because like I say every show, uh, Mother, what do you want your audience to take away from your comedy? Oh, that's a good question. You know what? I want people to come in and be entertained, but I always try to slip in something to think about. You know what I'm saying? Something outside of just being entertained to think about, because I have a bit where I talk about my nephew and he's over six feet tall and he does not play basketball. He just, he, he's like, a, he's like, a, he's like a, he's got a little 14 year old cheruby face, but he's almost 20. I won't say his name. My sister will kill me. But to know that I know he's the sweetest kid I know, the world doesn't know that. And he's in danger. And I kind of say, you know, we didn't work this hard to get you to a college to become anybody's hashtag. And Aunt Mugga's not marching. A lot of people don't laugh at that, but I mean that when I say, Aunt Mugga ain't marching. I'm sorry to take the show there, but yeah, we have to protect our children. That's there. a very, very, take it there. especially our male children. Girls, yes. we have to protect all of our children, but the male child, black male children are, they have a target on their back. I worry about my nephews just being kids at times. I have younger nephews. I'm like, they see the news. They see what we're talking about. There's always something happening and they're under siege almost. I worry about their states of mind with seeing the news. I need to always express and, and help them to understand and know you are loved and cared for. Yeah, you got to deal with that stuff out there. No, because a lot of our kids don't know. You can care for a child. If they don't feel it and know it, you have to try harder. They need to have an understanding of that. Things might not be perfect, but here you are loved and you're safe. You go out into the world understanding that you're loved and safe, you, you do your best on your part to get back home safely to your family when you feel loved. Because you know something, if it goes left, hey, <laughs> hey, yeah. Mugger, you're not going to make me cry this morning. But thank I'm not you. trying to. I know. I'm just passionate about that. We needed, we needed to hear that. We needed to hear that. And I'm an advocate for that. And I, I stand up for that all day, every day. You know, and, and a lot of <clears throat> our young Black men out there are not as fortunate to have had, you know, my father used to say to me, your job is to come home. Mm. I don't care what happens out there in the streets. Your job is to come home, make sure that you come home. And, as, and that was said with love. And yeah. now it's making me feel a way because why should I have to tell a child that? Mm -hmm. What what must you have thought to hear it? You know, your father loves you and he wants he wants mm -hmm. you to come home, like you said, but what's going on out there? That I, I was terrified. I mean, I was very young then. This was wow. not, I, I don't even think I was a teenager yet. Wow. I don't even think I was a teenager. I think I was probably 10 or 11 years old when he said that to me. Mm -hmm. And where I grew up, it was in that era, it was very, very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so there were certain things that he would say and he would, you know, make me do, don't wear that hoodie. And this is before Trayvon Martin, because yeah. I'm, I'm not Gen Z, I'm a, I'm a millennial. This yeah. is before Trayvon, don't wear that hoodie. I know you want to wear your hair cut this way, but we're going to wear it a different way because mm -hmm. they profile you. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how light you, as you can see, look, Mugger, I'm blending in with my wall back here. But it doesn't matter. <laughs> nope. It doesn't matter because I'm still black. Yeah. And he made sure that I was aware of that. You know, yeah. we've had a contentious relationship throughout the years, but one thing I take from, one thing I take from him is that he instilled absolute accountability in me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
and that's one thing I take from him. Yeah. Absolutely. Now that um, that that that's a that's a lot to take in for any child, but you walk through your life with those messages and understanding of that. Ten or eleven years old. Now, mm -hmm. there's something in particular that really it doesn't it very it upsets me with the fact that not being hurt is tied into what a black man is wearing or a black child is wearing a hoodie. Everybody wears hoodies. But when you're black and in a hoodie, you're suspect. No matter how young or old you are, you've done something wrong or you're menacing to someone, even if you're a child. Our children are referred to as men when they're still boys. You ever notice that on the news? I was like, no, that's a child. Time. A 15-year-old a child. Those are children. And you talk about what someone wears. I will say this. Malcolm X was murdered in a suit. Martin Luther King was murdered in a suit. Mega Evers was wearing a suit. All these men were murdered in suits. So what does their clothing have to do with it? Nothing. Sorry to take it there, but that that's part of who take I am. It's there, not just the jokes. So. Take it there. Take it there. I love this. To see what I mean? I, I knew we were going to have a great moment. I hope so. Because this is my foundation. No, mm -hmm. this is my foundation. And I and I and and this is what I wanted. And I, I knew you were going to give us something poignant. And that is what I wanted. Because we can joke all day. Yeah. But you got to, to show people you really love them and care for them, you got to hit them with every side of it. Absolutely. And love is the thing I like people to leave my show with. See, I couldn't answer you before. It sounds corny and cliche, but it's not. Because I look at children a lot, especially in our, in our communities. And people will call a child bad. No, children are not bad. Somebody failed along the way. I don't know if it was a teacher, a parent, society. People fail children along the way. It's not a child's job to raise themselves. That's not a job. That, no. You, you grow and your parents teach you lessons on how to take care of yourselves. But children need to know and understand. Number one, I'm 10. 10 is a child. We pour into them so many adult things because they have to navigate this world. And like your dad and most dads would say, just come home safely. I often think about how a child receives that. And it makes me sad. It really makes me sad, especially now. It's like people want to take things back to, you know, they want to take it back to. I'm like, no, no, no. First of all, I'm not going. Second of all, it's my job as an adult Black woman to express my love to our children, to make sure they understand that they're loved so they will not feel comfortable hating one another. If I love you, I cannot point a gun at you and shoot you, but I first have to love myself. And it's that simple. You don't have to have on the, the right pair of sneakers to feel loved. You don't need to have on $300 jeans to feel loved or to express love, but we've been conditioned in certain areas to believe that that's, that's normal. And it's not. And I want to be a real part of the undoing of some of that thinking. Aside from jokes, I mean, that thinking is like what people do to people up here. You can't you can't enslave people for 400 years without seeing them as unhuman in the first place. So that's where a lot of that comes from. And some of us have bought into it. You have to understand you're human. Love yourself first. I look at another Black woman and I look at her with love because I have to see a reflection of myself. Or a human being, not just Black people, but human beings. But you understand what I'm speaking to in this moment. It's about us. I don't, I don't have a problem saying that un unapologetically. Yeah. Say it all the time. Listen, me and you are on the same page. Yeah. yeah. So don't, and, and that's one time, don't be afraid to say whatever you have to say. Just say it. Because it needs to be said and, and it needs to be heard. Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. Social media. This, this is this is where my age comes in. I can't stand it, but I know I have to do it. I have I have uh, Instagram. I'm at Just Mugga on Instagram and on Facebook. It's Mugga Phoenix. M U G G A P H O E N I X. And I not on Twitter. But those are the two that I have. You can go on. I, I post. Uh, I post flyers for current shows and upcoming shows. And sometimes I'll post some clips from some movie and film stuff that I'm working on. And uh, yeah, uh, nice. that's it. So, okay. So that's at Just Mother on Instagram. Uh -huh. Jokes and jokes. You as in understand. S is in stand up. 
T as in Thomas from Flight 828. M as in money. U as in unlimited. G as in green. G as in gold. A as in ascension. Go follow our new friend and wow. please be respectful. Be as respectful to her as you would to someone handling your food. All right? I like that. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Listen, I'll be, I be going. I'll be, I'll just, you be going. Like, and you just be going. When you got up to the M, you said money, and I thought about it. Apparently, mugga is a slang word for money in Philly. I've never heard that. I looked yes. it up on the internet. Yes. I was like, Yes. Okay, well, I'll manifest yes, some of that to, to me yes. and the name. I'm like, okay, that means it something. <laughs> Mother is slang for, Philly, for money in Philly, and then Fetty is <laughs> slang like in this area, like yes. in North Jersey, New York. Yeah, yes. The, kid, um, the kids taught me Fetty a few years ago. I was like, what's Fetty? I know a, a brother uh -huh. named Fetty, he was a filmmaker, but yeah, Fetty means money too. But see, Mother, I be, we be in sync. Like, we be in sync. I just be, I be knowing. And, and I'm like, how did I know that you knew that? I don't, <laughs> I did an investigation, Chris. I did an investigation. <laughs> but what is your sign? You, you mentioned- I'm a Capricorn. I'm a Capricorn. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. My favorite aunt who I was talking about, she's a Capricorn. So Capricorn, Scorpio, or simpatico on certain but Listen, ways. we yeah. hang tough. Yeah. We, we, we definitely do. Like my, exactly. I have them, I'm surrounded by, by Scorpios or uh, whatever. My best friends growing up, they were Scorpios. Okay. Um, my one of my good friends now, she's a Scorpio. Joanna's a Scorpio. Yes, she uh, is. My mother is on the cusp, so she's like a Libra Scorpio. Oh, even and better. I like Libra. My grandmother, too. she was a Scorpio. So, you know, nice. I'm, I'm surrounded and then you I You're in good Scorpio. company. You are in good company. Did you feel the sting? <laughs> What'd you say? What'd you say? I said, did you feel the sting of the Scorpios? <laughs> but the sting doesn't bother me. I'm good. It's a good sting. It's not a, a bad sting. sting. Mm -mm. sting doesn't bother. Now, what does bother me is those jellyfish stings when you go down the shore. And... Those are the bad ones. Those yeah. are the bad ones. Those are those are uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Even though a Scorpio could kill you, but <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but but I don't do nothing to make the Scorpio want to kill me. I, 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 you know what? There's so many different, um, you know, people who have their rumors about how Scorpio right. people are. But, and I've noticed that over the years I've met men and women, I think they differ from October to November. Mm -hmm. I think people differ yep, in temperament. I think people differ in ways. Just we're human beings, number one. Right. But there are certain threads that carry through the signs because it does matter. But I don't think we're all one way. No matter what our signs are, There's nobody's oh, just one everybody's thing. Everybody's different. Yeah. What's, what's though? I back, back to uh, you know, like the stand up and everything. What's the wildest thing you've seen go down while you were up on stage? Oh, somebody threw a Heineken bottle at a comedian on stage at a show in Brooklyn. I won't say the name of the club. Years ago, I mean, it was <laughs> it was in Flatbush too, but it wasn't a Heineken bottle. It was a Heineken bottle. <laughs> Glad. I was like, oh my God, I'm not going up there. <laughs> yeah, no. it, got, it got rough. And the comedian wasn't even talking to the person who threw the bottle. He just didn't like what he heard and threw a bottle. Thank God it hit the ground and not the comic. But yeah. Right. Yep. Back in the days. I don't even know how to come back from that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, with people getting yeah. slapped nowadays on stage, and yeah. I know a couple of comedians who've gotten cotton hit. And gotten into fights in recent months, and I'm, I'm not cool with that at all. I mean, you come to a comedy club to unwind and laugh. If you don't like a joke, don't laugh. But to be physical with someone, I don't, I don't support that at all. You That's know, insanity. mother. I'm gonna tell you something. The older I get, the more I realize that we're going in a different direction than where we should be going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Day is night, right is wrong. Yep. Yes. Yeah. It's just like yeah. what we know to be true because we all grew up being taught things a certain way is now not true. I know. Things I that know. people were being shamed for and punished for before, now they're being applauded for. Celebrated. They're being celebrated for, for nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. The world just gets, I tell you, mugger, it gets crazier and crazier. And 
sometimes like I'm like you, like I like to be in person and I like to hug and I like to be yeah. around mm-hmm. people because I'm, I'm an extrovert. I'm a people person. Mm-hmm. I'm sometimes- not an extrovert. That's the crazy part. I'm kind. I'm physical, okay. but I'm, I'm not. That's when you turn it on. And people don't know that. I like to spend a lot of time alone. I'm alone yeah. a lot, but my work yeah. takes me into spaces with lots of people and I'm friendly. So it works out. But as far as the craziness of the world, having come through a three-year pandemic, you would think that humanity would have evolved to a better place spiritually. And it seems like people are devolving from, from the top down because we can't forget who was running this country a few years ago and just helped her. I'm not even going to mention the name, right. but things have right. been completely, obviously, right. more obviously, off the chain ever exactly. since. Everything. They they became emboldened. Oh that. yeah, oh yeah. And oh, yeah. what I will say though, because I do, I, I totally believe in in what you're saying, is other of us are. We are evolving. We mm-hmm. are, you know, changing and growing and flowing and becoming what it is that we're supposed to become. And we will ascend. Those other people, they're just going to be left behind. The thing is, it's our job to some degree, those of us who believe that we're evolving and not devolving, to spread it. Like what you do with your kids, what we do at comedy shows. It may just be a comedy show to someone, but to make a person laugh or to convince a person that to laugh and relax. People say laughter is medicine. I agree. I won't compare myself to a doctor, but I've had people come up to me and be like, you know what? I was having a bad day. Thank you. Or I wasn't even going to come. My friends made me come. And I'm glad I did because I feel better because I laughed. When you know your position in humanity, it's your job to do what you're supposed to do in terms of, of spreading the positive parts of who you are. Some people don't know. Like some kids who people call bad, some of them don't know better. Some might need medication, not all. But that medication thing, that's a whole nother thing. That's another show. Because that came about in the early 70s when they were just medicating, especially black boys. They started just medicating them. Oh, he's bad. Oh, ADHD. Oh, everything ain't ADHD. Okay. What what are you doing? To, what are you doing to get his attention? Is he interested? Do you care? Does he feel like you care? Or she? Do these kids feel like you care about them? Or did you just come to to sit here for eight hours and get a check? You know? We're going to definitely talk about this um, Mm -hmm. after the, because I got some choice words. We're definitely going to talk about this a little bit. Before it's a lot. I know I'm a comedian. I'm supposed to be saying funny stuff, but I have no, no, no. This, this is fine. This is mugger. This is outstanding. Okay. You know what? You now you're going to make me cry. We're both going to be crying. I really appreciate the fact that you did think of me and you said you manifested it because sometimes we. We miss each other. Like, you know, you got a lot of good people in the world who keep missing each other. People who need to, wait a minute. Y'all got something to share. And in sharing, you can, you you know what? You can help someone with what you share together. So I think it's important that we we don't miss each other. We got to slow down and be like, okay, this I'm supposed to go this way today. That spirit is pulling me this way. All right. Got it. Yeah. And we were in alignment. I mean, everything happened the way it was supposed to happen. Um, you know, it, it it did, it did, it, it did. Um, before we wrap, and I like to ask all my guests this, if you had a time machine, what would you go back and tell yourself in the past? Hmm. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Just don't, don't be scared. I, I dealt with a lot of second guessing because of fear. And I think the fact that I even became a comedian, it helped me conquer some of my fears. I still have others, but I noticed the growth in having become a comedian. I'm able to use my voice and strengthen it and to be less and less afraid. And when I say fear, I mean, just to to do things, to change things, to take risks. You know, a lot of times we're not encouraged as children to do certain things. Encourage yourself. 
I know that you one can encourage themselves. I didn't know that as a as a kid. You know, I would I would tell myself to be encouraged, to be encouraged, and it's okay. It's okay to think differently because some people. I I don't want to get into that. That's for another show. <laughs> For another show, Marga, go, Marga, people go. People who stand out, people who stand out, it's their responsibility to be outstanding. You understand? You just can't stand out and be like, "Oh, she's a weirdo." No, I'm out here in this on my own. But what am I doing to actually be outstanding? What is my thing? You have to find your thing, not just the thing that puts you out there, but how do you stand apart from the rest? No matter what you do, whether you're a journalist, a teacher, a comedian, the way you told me you had to leave that school for several reasons, you didn't just come to school to be a teacher. You came with, you were a father, a uncle, a therapist. You had to bring all of this because that's part of who you are. You didn't just come to do a job. And that's why it was so frustrating to you. You knew better. They didn't want to do better by the kids. But you knew better. Yeah. It's a frustration. But I thank you that you did it anyway, because we need more teachers and kids need to see more teachers who look like them. And by them, I mean you. <laughs> yeah. Mugger, it's important. You're not going to make me cry. This is the part where people make me cry. Apparently, this, we both <laughs> this is the part. Too old and <laughs> this is the part. This is always the part. <laughs> but, um, Aside from the festival, though, aside from the festival, and thank you so much for coming on, and thank you for sharing, and thank you for being so open, and thank you for just talking and, and saying what you wanted to say, because that's what I wanted you to do anyway. I try and, to stay on topic. I know I got oh, away please. a little bit. I get oh, emotional, no. but thank you. Listen, thank you for pulling me back. <laughs> we, listen, it, it, we go off topic here. We go off the deep end. We Listen, we careen off the West Side Highway all the time. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> But aside from the festival, mm -hmm. is there anything else you have coming up? You know what? I did a film that I can't talk about. And that's that's all I can say. With a very big comedian that hasn't come out yet, I can't talk. But it's a Miramax film. It's coming soon. I also did an episode of a show called Girls 5 Eva. It's on Netflix now. It was on NBC Universal. And I have a small part in a Lakeith Stansfield series coming to Apple TV called Improbable Valentine. Follow Mother, and once again, the Black Women in Comedy Laugh Fest begins Wednesday, June 14th, runs through Sunday, June 18th. I think that's actually Father's Day, so take your dad out for some jokes, yeah. some laughs. Well, um, I don't have to dig him up to take him out, but thank you. Well, no, I'm, I'm talking, I, I, I don't mean, you're, you're, I'm talking about the, you know. I'm messing with you, I know you're talking to the okay. people. Okay. I was trying to throw in a joke, but it was a bad one. Sorry. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> it was good. I appreciated it. <laughs> I appreciate it. I hope it. he's up there. Sorry, Dad. Yeah. Sorry. Well, well, listen, he'll be there in spirit. He'll be there in spirit. And he and, was funny, too. I got some of my oh, from awesome. him. Yes, he was funny. My dad yeah. was funny. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, uh, visit uh, BWIC Laugh Fest. That's uh, L-A-F-F-Fest.com for more. Um, and Mugga, thank you so much for coming. Through. Thank you for having me. I appreciate and, you so and, much. And next time you come on, because I want time. you to, I want you to come on again. There's going to oh, be a next time. Sorry. Next time you come on, we're going to talk shit about these celebrities because I know you got some shit. I, you know what? I, I don't even know none of them people. I don't think... <laughs> well, listen, it'll be all me. Okay. I'll just be the one talking shit. Because okay. listen, Mugga, listen. Mugga's a sweetheart. I'll blink. I'll blink if I agree. I blink twice okay. if I disagree. Blink oh, once if I disagree. That's a good one. We're not going to drag her into the time fool. We're not. We're not. But before you all drag me, I know it's been a minute. And we've been busy here at the Chris David Show, and busy is good. So stay tuned because we have more interviews and some, well, some surprises. Tell your friends, tell your mama, tell your daddy, tell your baby daddy, tell your boyfriend, tell your cat, tell your dog, tell your doctor. Tell Tell Mugga's Auntie Janelle to follow us on Instagram at Chris David TV and follow our show at The Chris David Show on Instagram and YouTube. You can also visit ChrisDavidShow.com. There you'll find everything you need to know about the show. And y'all stay tuned and be safe out there this Memorial Day weekend. Salute to all our vets and y'all be well. Hi, this is Mugga. Don't miss the Black Women in Comedy Fest. 
Visit D-W-I-C-L-A-F-F-F-E-S-T.com for tickets and more. Hope to see you there.